moment of inertia. I submitted a theory about inertia. It isn't getting any momentum. So what is this moment of inertia? It sounds a little bit strange, but really the key thing is this. It's an object's resistance to a change in rotational motion, which means if the moment of inertia is large, then it's really going to resist changes, whereas if it's small, it's like it's easy to make changes to it. Another thing to remember is that a moment of inertia, it's kind of like a uh, mass. At least it's the rotational equivalent of it. Um, so first of all, we have an equation in our uh, data booklet, and it goes like this. So it's I equals sigma m r squared. Okay. So let's define our variables. First of all, we have this new variable called I, which is a moment of inertia. We've got m, which is the mass in kilograms. We've got r, which is the radius in meters. So then what would the units be for moment of inertia? Well, remember, sigma just means add up all that. So that means like, you know, add up all the m's times each of their r's squared. But it just means add up all those. So it has no units. So that means it's going to be units of mass, which is kilograms, times units of distance squared, which is meters squared. In other words, it's going to be kilograms, because of the m, and it's going to be r squared. That'll make it meters squared. So it's kind of weird, but there it is. Now, the moment of inertia, it does depend on how the mass is distributed. So different shapes of totally different moments of inertia. For example, a pendulum is nice and simple because it's just got it's just got one mass in one distance right this is one radius here and one mass therefore i would just be just m r squared if this right here for example would just be r here that would be the radius about which it's sort of rotating remember because this thing right here is uh, oscillating i mean so it's going to go back and forth and back and forth like this so just one mass is nice and easy it's just it's got one radius so there we go but if it's a more complicated shape, I mean, technically, like in university we were learning, we were doing lots of integration over this whole surface. But in our course, we can be a lot simpler. We're just going to add up all the terms. So as tough as it might get would be something like this. Like what if I had, you know, like a I is going to be, let's say I've got like three different, let's say I've got three different points, one here, one over there, one over there. Then I would just say, all right, how do we deal with this? We would say m1 times r1 squared. We would add to that the second one, so m2 r2 squared plus m3 times r3 squared, and I think you get the idea. So this would be just you know how it would go in theory. In practice, though, you're usually going to get the values that you need. Okay, so that's why I wrote this one right here. So in exam tip, you'll probably be given what you need if you need it. And I love this one right here because this one says, the other person says, wait, give me a moment. And then someone's like flashbacks, like, oh my God, moment of inertia. And in fact, let's use this. Look, we've actually got two of them right here if we need them. So for example, for a solid sphere, hey, a solid sphere going around its axis here, I is going to be two-fifths mr squared. Okay, so that will be this one, for example. So two-fifths times m times r squared. Whereas this one here will be different, a solid cinder, the cylinder that's rotating about this axis here, well that'll be this one right here, it's going to be half mr squared. Okay, so this i, this moment of inertia, is going to be half mr squared. So it's different. I really like this, how we could almost use this like a meme or this flashback here to actually figure out real things. But like I said, it's on your exams. You don't have to memorize these. You'll probably be given them if you need them. Otherwise, you might have to calculate them, but you'll just use the equation, you know, the sigma mr squared. There you go. Okay, so let's consider an example. We have two spheres of the same radius, and they're on an incline, some sort of, you know, hill going down. And each of these ones here is just going to roll down the hill. And we're releasing them at the same time, and they have the same size. One of them is solid, one of them is hollow, and they have different moments of inertia. You're given this. And the question is, which sphere will reach the bottom first, and why? So one easy way to solve this is just to think about, hey, remember what the definition is of moment of inertia. It is the resistance to rotational change. So in this case right here, which of these has the smallest moment of inertia? Well, two-fifths is smaller than two-thirds. So that means this one right here has the smallest moment of inertia. And what does that mean? Well, that means that it's going to resist the motion least, so it's going to be the easiest to move. It'll get down to the bottom first. Now, another way to think about it is like this. 
So this means that solid one, which again has the smallest um, moment of inertia, means that it'll resist the motion less, and that means it has more translational kinetic energy left over. In other words, it arrives first. And we could say the same idea for this hollow one, number two, right? Because it has a larger I, uh, the moment of inertia, that means it'll resist the motion more, and that means it has less translational kinetic energy left over. The basic conclusion is this one right here arrives first. Okay, so we could say that solid sphere number one then, of course, will reach the bottom first. And again, that's just because it has the smallest moment of inertia, so it resists the motion the least. I've been kind of explaining the same thing over and over again, but the basic idea is just this, right? That the definition of moment of inertia is how much it resists the motion. So whichever one resists it the least will be the easiest to push around and make changes to.